Hello, I'm Adam. I'm Adrian. And welcome to Cast from the Crypt. Today we're talking about The Menu. It just came out. Per your recommendation, I watched it. And how did you feel about it? Recommendation, strong word. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> I, uh, I think this is a uh, i thought this was going to be way worse than it was it is fairly mediocre okay um, i mean i think it's fine but i think it does some interesting things and for me where it falls off is a little towards the end what did you think about it uh i think you like it more than i did i remember the first time i saw a commercial for this movie in the theaters I wasn't really hooked. Um, it looked, oh, yeah, me neither. Yeah, it looked kind of predictable and unoriginal. And watching the movie, I can say it was exactly what I thought it would be. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was really average. Yet, I am seeing, or at least I have seen, that... Mm -hmm. At large, this movie is being really well received. People yes, love is. this movie, and I, uh, I don't know what that's all about. I don't understand the hype. I yeah, guess. I don't disagree with you. I, I definitely think it's fairly run of the mill. I also, I mean, because I'm pretty sure we might have been together when we saw that trailer. I, I did think this was going to be way worse. I looked at your review. Uh, you know, your your stars. I'm sorry, I spoiled it. <laughs> no, no, no. And it's not that much different than our. I gave it, I think, a, a half star more than you. And so, yes, I do think I like this movie a little bit more than you did. And I, I think, honestly, most of that comes down to the fact that I like the cast. You know? I mean, I, I like the cast. Um, there's a lot of people in this movie that I enjoy watching them. And uh, for the most part, I thought this movie was like really, I guess, uh, inoffensive for like the first 45 minutes. I was, yeah, it rolled out a carpet for me and I was walking along it and I was there for the ride. And then the movie starts to drag pretty aggressively, you know, in my opinion. And that's where it lost me, as I said before. But at the beginning, I was, I was like, okay, maybe this isn't the run-of-the-mill Hollywood schlock that I thought um, it would be. And then it kind of just turns out to be exactly that, which is disappointing. And we can we can talk about its shortcomings, I suppose. But I do think that the cast here is pretty solid. You know, like I like Ralph Fiennes a lot. Of course, most people probably know him because of Harry Potter, but he's so fantastic in so many other things uh, that, you know... It, his reputation kind of precedes him. Um, I like John Leguizamo fine. He's got a lot of duds, but I just kind of like seeing him in things. Uh, I, of course, really like Anya Taylor-Joy, which I think you do too. Um, Absolutely. Nicholas Holt. I, I like him just oh, fine too. I so, love him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so you know, I was... Uh, I hadn't really seen what the cast of this movie was. The only two people I had seen that I had remembered from the trailer were Anya Taylor-Joy and Ralph Fiennes. Um, so the rest were just kind of pleasant surprises. Yeah, uh, the cast is nice. It's moderately kind of big name, I guess. But just the cast alone was not going to do it for me, especially considering a lot of these characters um, aren't really characters. It Really, mm -hmm. in my opinion, the only two characters that are fleshed out are Ray Fiennes, uh, who plays Chef Julian Slawick, and Anya Taylor-Joy, who plays Margot. Uh, they felt like real characters. They had real motivations, real conflicts. And everybody else just felt like maybe a somewhat famous actor um, who's really one-dimensional. You know, they're all supposed to be unlikable. So by the end of the movie... When everybody starts getting picked off, you don't care. But it also makes it feel like there's no stakes, you know? By the end of this movie, um, and spoilers, by the end of this movie, 
pretty much almost everyone dies, and yet it still feels like we got out of it scot-free. If that makes sense. Yeah. Like, the character we care about lives, and then we really don't care about the other ones. It feels like there's no net loss, and the villains are gone. So, in a way, it's like a happy ending, yet it it, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be a happy ending. It should be, you know, most people died. No, that's true. That's true. I will say this, right? I, I, I agree with you. They do this thing where you have a group of people at this restaurant and all of these people are flawed. Well, you know, there's a point later on in the movie where Ray finds his character is, you know, he, he starts to out people's secrets using dishes as, as his platform, I suppose. Right. Like for example, he prints, what is it? He prints like receipts to embezzled funds on like a tortilla <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and presents that to these young businessmen that are doing shady practices and so on. I mean, there's a there's every character has something on them, something that they're trying to hide at this point in the movie. And you know, all these people die; they go on to die. And and the the problem is is that they are all really awful. Like all the people that are in this restaurant that are they're having their dirty laundry aired out and they are going to be murdered, I don't care about any of them because they do establish early on that they are all kind of, in the scope of the movie, irredeemable people. And I, I don't know. that. Why do I care that they're all going to die? I do wonder if the movie wants you to care about these people, right? I will say they successfully, and at least in my opinion, like I, I cared about Anya Taylor-Joy's character. For several reasons. There's some plot things that happen that uh, a big reveal that really makes her quite the, the sympathetic character, but also just her performance is decent enough. And, and so you're you're interested in her. Um, and there's also a, a, a layer of mystery to this character that that keeps you engrossed and, and following her. So part of me wonders if the movie doesn't really want you to care about the other people. But then to your point, what is the point of all of this? Right? Why are we why are we watching them for, uh, what is it, an hour and a half? Two hours? Almost two hours, this movie? You know, why, why are we sitting here and during the runtime if we don't care about anybody else? Yeah, well, I think the movie doesn't want you to care about them, but I kind of hate that. I hate how right. reduced they are, reduced to pretty much just being props. They're all annoying and rude, right off the bat, at least. We get no redeeming qualities on screen. And then, uh, like you said, there's always some reveal of like, this guy cheated on his wife. These people embezzled money. And it's like, they just, they want, they're setting these characters up to be hateable. But it feels so reductive and tiring at this point. How many movies have you seen where there's a huge group of rich people and they're not good people in general? So it's okay to kill them off. Like, I'm tired of that. I'm tired of this setup. That is what I most disliked about this movie. I'm just tired of the setup of rich people go to a place and then they get trapped. And then, you know, bad things happen. They start getting picked off, whatever. It's this, like, I don't know, this, like, uh, fictitious depiction of, like, an elite that are utter freaks and do weird freaky things and it never feels realistic and i'm tired of movies like that you know that's how like all the purge movies are there's like a few home invasion movies like that there's uh well yeah there was movie. a there was a string of movies that came out <laughs> in like the last three years that do kind of all do that same thing there's that other one that i'm trying to think of right now and i I can't. I think uh, rich people hunt poor people. Exactly. You know, yeah, exactly. I forget what it's called. It might even be called The Hunt. Yeah, but, I, I, uh, I think I do know what you're talking about, yeah. Yeah, and there's even similar you know, characters that are unlikable, and it makes the audience beg the question. Blah, 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 you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. This is tired. It it's is. It's tired. It is, and maybe the elite is bad. Yes, sure, that's... You know, there's there there's good social critique movies like that, like Parasite, where the elite is fundamentally wrong and, you know, part of an evil system. But here, 
in these sort of movies, it's like the elite is bad because they're mean, because they're rude, because they're jerks. Like, there's no real reason. Well, and, my my favorite is the food critic that she left bad review, and that's like literally why he wants her dead. Oh yeah, <laughs> yes. I mean, all of them too. That's my... He wants those uh, that one couple dead because they aren't into it as much as they should be. Like they don't remember what they had last time they were there, and the husband cheated on the wife. But like, okay, is cheating on your wife a reason to be killed off in this elaborate pageantry? You know, it's he also had that dead daughter incest fantasy oh yeah i guess you are right about that yeah well, I mean, but... what about his wife though what did his wife do <laughs> no no yeah i don't know what his wife did i don't know what his wife did it yeah it is giving very much like rich people bad which fair you, you know but maybe there's a more unique way to go about yeah, this. well rich people uh, bad but not because of this not for these reasons it's not just because they're right. rude you know Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. Off the record, real quick. Sure. How do you feel about people writing in the pandemic now? Writing in the pandemic? I mean, it's... Like, they're writing it in the Kind movies. of inevitable. I like how they did it in this movie. You do? Okay. okay. Well, I, let's talk about it. Why off the record? Let's talk about it. I don't know. I was, okay, okay, fine. Let's get um, into it. Um, one character makes, like, a single reference, a single joke about it, and I think that's tasteful. It doesn't take up any of the runtime, but it's also, like, not pretending that didn't happen. Yeah, yeah. I saw another movie late last year that, 2022, uh, that also wrote in the pandemic, the new Knives Out movie, Glass Onion. They write it in, in a similar way, kind of. Um, and I don't know. I don't hate it, right? I mean, it is inevitable, you're right. Movies are a form of storytelling, and yada yada people look to these stories for an escape i suppose i just i guess i'm shocked at the amount of people writing in the pandemic like i I think i've seen maybe three or four movies at this point that have written it in and it's like one or two lines it's not essential to the plot so you know me i question why at that point but i also understand that maybe some folks would think it needs to be written in here it does make sense because you know it's about a restaurant trying to stay alive during the lockdown and how they go about that so i I guess it makes sense here yeah it's it's one throwaway joke too i don't mind it yeah um another thing about this movie ray finds character chef slawick he runs this island of fanatical sous chefs uh and rich people come out to it and are supposed to be treated to an evening of, like, the most fancy and well-thought-out dishes in the world. But he kind of goes crazy. He loses his passion for making it because the elite he cooks for are so unbearable and superficial. So here is his final menu. This is the final time he's doing it, uh, and he's trapped everyone there. And they're all going to die. He says that pretty quickly into the movie. You're all going to die tonight. And his character feels serious. He has intent. He really is trying to do this crazy, artful show. And then he's going to kill himself and everyone else with his ride or die following of sous chefs. And all the other characters, the victims, this elite that's being preyed upon... They, they seem like they don't care. Like they really, to me, do not do enough to try to prevent this yeah. from happening. They just kind of let it happen. Not once do they yeah. really try to escape. Like one guy tries to break a window that ends up being of bulletproof glass. And that's it. That's, <laughs> that's the extent of what they will do to try to not die. Yeah. And the the funnier part of that is that the movie expects you to believe that i mean how many people are there dining you think with 12 15 12 people yeah about 12 you're gonna tell me that those 12 people aren't going to like bum rush people and and you know have a battle to get out oh that's what i was thinking the whole time yeah but it never happens it never happens they never do you know one could speculate that the movie is trying to say that 
they're so rich that they don't actually ever expect it's actually going to happen. I don't know. I can't help but wonder if it's trying to make some sort of point by doing that, but they really don't. There's even a line at the end of the movie where someone, it might be Ray Fiennes' character, but someone says, well, y'all, y'all, y'all hardly struggled. Yeah, right. Yeah, he does. You sat there and you took it. Right. And, And so the movie does point that out. But they do literally. It's the guy that throws the stool against the window, and John Logazamo's character. <laughs> there's that whole Coast Guard snafu. At one point in the movie, Anya Taylor Joy's character, her name is Margot. She sneaks off and finds a ham radio and calls the Coast Guard on the ham radio, or is it like a CB radio? What's the difference? I don't even know. She finds one of those radios and calls the Coast Guard for help and. Sure enough, Coast Guard arrives, guy comes in with a gun uh, on his hip, and he sees John Logazamo's character, who plays a famous movie star, right? But kind of uh, in the, the, the latter half of his career, right? He's no longer um, as famous as he once was. He's a has-been. And he's like, oh my God, I love your movie. Can I get an autograph? And John Logazamo writes him an autograph on a napkin, but it turns out to say, help us. And there's this whole debacle where the Coast Guard pulls out a gun and threatens Ray Fiennes and nobody in the kitchen is reacting at all to this guy. And, you know, I thought maybe the Coast Guard was going to die, that they would kill him somehow. Nope. Turns out Coast Guard just works there. He is also a chef. It was all for nothing. It's this like super lame reveal. I don't know why they did this. That is the part of the movie that made me go, nope, this is not that great anymore. Like, I'm I'm not on this ride the way I once was that really, really set me back for me. Because why go through, go through the trouble of even having that radio in that room for Anya Taylor joy call. If it was all like a gag for me, that moment of like, this is tiring. Um, it's losing me was when a little bit before that scene, they act like they're going to hunt the men. They they say you have a 45 (laughs) second head start (laughs) go. And all the men run away. And um, then the, like, sh- bodyguards on the island go to hunt them. And when they catch them, they literally just, like, walk them back to the kitchen. And it's, uh, you know, what was the point of this whole hunt scene? Uh, but while the men are doing that, the women are still inside. And they're, like, kind of chatting. And uh, one of the female sous chefs is talking with them. And she's like, yeah, I'm really excited about how we're all going to die artistically. And I think Janet McTeer's character just goes, well, I think I need another drink. And I was so done. <laughs> that, that, that finished. That was it for me. Yeah. I was like, really? <laughs> that is, like, I think verbatim what she says. Yeah, and I don't know. The humor in this movie was, there wasn't enough of it or there was too much of it, you know? They didn't commit to it. And it uh, it felt like most of the movie didn't exist. He also, like, at the begin, the first main dish that we get, there was, like, an appetizer, but then the first main dish he cooks is, like, a uh, chicken thigh with a golden pair of scissors in it. And he says it's because when he was a child, he had to stab his dad with some scissors so he would quit choking his mom. And his mom is just, like, sitting in the corner the entire movie. I don't think she speaks more than twice. Yeah, she like grunts and Yeah, and she and this story exist purely to show that this character is unhinged, which like you probably know <laughs> if you're watching this movie <laughs> cuz yeah. You're watching this movie. And uh but but with the dish he serves, the dish has a tiny pair of golden scissors stabbed into the chicken thigh. So every single person has at least one pair of scissors. And then he takes uh, Margot, Anya Taylor-Joy's character, off into his office and, like, talks to her um, separately because she's special because she was not supposed to be there. And the whole time I was like, stab him. Stab him. Just stab him. Like, they acted like, well, you're going to die and there's nothing you can do. But if this one man was killed before he could do all this pageantry, then that would completely derail his whole plans. And he never does anything to protect himself or anyone else, he goes into the crowd of these people he's torturing, and is just, like, among them, he, like, pats him on the shoulder, 
There's no one guarding him. Like, he's so vulnerable. They could kill him at any second. And if it, di- it didn't feel realistic, but it also didn't feel fantastical or satirical right. enough yeah. to justify it not being realistic. Right, which I completely agree with. To speak to Margot, Anya Taylor-Joy's character, a little bit, um, you know, one of the few things I actually think works in this movie uh, until the end. Um, Nicholas Holt plays a character named Tyler, and again, Anya Taylor-Joy plays Marco. And at the beginning of the, mo- the movie, we open up and we see these two on a dock, and Tyler is almost giddy. And he's waiting with Margot. I think she's smoking a cigarette and he's complaining about how she's ruining her palate because he has had reservations to this isolated island restaurant for, I don't know, he says months, years, a really long time. So at the beginning of the movie, we are led to believe that Tyler and Margot are in a relationship. He even calls her babe. And, you know, that's that's what we take with us moving into the movie. As the movie progresses, I think one of the movie's strong suits is that they they do a pretty good job at showing us that this relationship isn't what we thought it was in the beginning. Subtle things here and there. Uh, there there's a moment in the beginning, uh, just after they leave the ferry when they arrive at the island, or excuse me, just after they leave the dock when they arrive at the island, um, Tyler goes to get his reservation in order. And it is revealed that he was bringing somebody that was not Margot. I forget the name that they asked, but um, it is not, it is not Margot. And Margot has to introduce herself, say, no, I'm actually here instead. And it's this awkward moment. It's kind of tense. Uh, you know, I don't know what, what you thought was happening in that moment, but I thought maybe like this is the new girlfriend or, Maybe he was cheating on this girlfriend. Uh, I didn't quite know what to take away from that reveal yet. But as the movie progresses, we start to understand this relationship more. Nicholas Holt's character is this fanatic of Ray Fiennes' character. He's a chef Slawick aficionado. He knows everywhere he's worked. He knows all of his specialty dishes. He has studied this man. He has studied all of his restaurants. um, And he is really about it, right? They, they, uh, there's some funny bits where uh, he is so excited about the food and there's all of these unhinged, insane things being said by either Chef Slawick, his staff, um, you know, the, the surrounding people. And Tyler is just like face deep in whatever dish he's being served. He's eating it all up pun intended. Um, That's when we start to understand that Margot is clearly not his girlfriend. And it is ultimately revealed that Margot is actually a a sex worker. She has been hired to go with Tyler last minute because um, his last date canceled. What I liked, the, the, the reveal that I really enjoyed is that Ray Fiennes his character clearly knows that there is a fanboy. And Tyler is doing all this obnoxious stuff throughout the movie. He's been asked not to take pictures of the dishes, and he's taking loud, flash-on, sound-on pictures of every dish that he's passed. Um, you know, he's asking a thousand questions all the time, interrupting when the chef is explaining the dishes. And there, there's this part in the movie, probably like the climax, where Chef Slawick really beats down Tyler and uh, forces him to cook this god-awful dish, and it goes poorly, and Tyler ends up killing himself. But just before that, it is revealed that Tyler knew that everybody was going to die, and he brought Anya Taylor-Joy's character anyway. He paid for a sex worker knowing that she was just going to be killed. She was only there uh, so that he could get in, basically, so that he had his little plus one, and could go on this one last final foodie excursion. Um, All that stuff, I enjoyed. I actually really, really liked uh, that that initial moment, or I I guess that that last moment where where Margot figures out that she has been not just betrayed, but like used in the worst possible way, honestly, like human cattle. 
um, brought here just to be, just so that they could get let into the door, right? Uh, basically a sacrifice is what she is. Yeah. And I like that she is the last one to, to make it out. Yeah, this is what I mean when I said, like, her character uh, and Ray Fine's character are the most fleshed out parts of the movie. Yeah. Is she has these cool reveals, and you get insight into her character. You can kind of tell what she's thinking through her actions, and also uh, through these little side conversations she has with characters and uh, with Ray Fines. And I do like that scene where they were getting onto the island, and it's not the woman that they have reserved. I don't know if you noticed, but not only uh, is it revealed that she's a different woman than the reservation was made for, but Tyler doesn't know her name. The sous chef woman who is welcoming everybody onto the island asks him what her last name is, Mrs. What, and he doesn't have an answer. So for me, I was like, okay, well, that's really interesting. That built interest into this element of the story for me really well. But even Tyler, like Tyler himself isn't that fleshed out. He kind of exists as part of Anya Taylor Joy's fleshing out because like he's sh- like you said he's eventually killed because he's shamed into killing himself basically he failed mm-hmm. the one guy he's a sycophant for but that does that make sense if he knew he was going to die anyway maybe yeah but okay why is he taking all these pictures if he knows he's going to die and if he didn't ki- if, if he didn't care about Anya Taylor Joy you know why is he Going out of his way to interrupt to the one guy he supposedly cares about to talk to her, you know, it's he kind of gets a little more inconsistent than Margot mm-hmm. is. That picture point is a really great point. Why is he taking? If he knew he was going to die, why is he doing that? Yeah, yeah, that's an excellent point. I didn't pick that up, and I didn't pick up the fact that he didn't know her last name either. Though, yeah, the the beginning of the movie where they're sort of building into what all of this is and the mystery behind Margot. That's where, you know, I I told you the beginning of this movie kind of had me and it did. And I think that's why, but you're right. There's a lot of inconsistencies and, and things just sort of fall off. You had talked about the, the like demented game of tag that they play (laughs) toward the uh, middle or latter half of the film. And you're right. They totally do build it up. Like they're going to kill these men. Ray Fine says, you have, this is your only chance to escape. Take it and let's see what happens. And, you know, sure enough, they're all caught and nothing comes of it. Nothing comes of it. Yeah, And like, even the finale to me felt like a, a whole nothing burger. I do want to talk about it. Do you want to describe it a little? So the movie is structured using the same structure that the chef in the movie is using for the evening. It goes by meal. Right. And each meal has its own title. And and that's sort of how the movie is broken up into little scenes, each meal serving as a different scene. The dessert, which, of course, is the last dish of the evening, is Chef Slawick's big goodbye, his last hurrah. You know, the, the, the big artful statement that he is trying to make this whole evening. And, <laughs> you know, for a whole movie, almost two hours building to this finale. Uh, To me, it felt really rushed and really, really lame. So I told you a little bit earlier that Anya Taylor-Joy's character sneaks off and uh, she's actually doing something for Chef Slawick. I think she's getting like a barrel of something. Do you remember exactly what she was looking for? Yeah, he just said the dessert is in a barrel. And so she was just looking for this barrel and they didn't elaborate what it was. Yeah, so he goes, or excuse me, she goes, Margot does, and gets the barrel for dessert. And while she does this, she breaks into his house and uses that radio to signal for help. But what she also finds while doing so is a picture of a very young Ray Fiennes, or very young Chef Slawick, I should say, uh, flipping patties at like a, you know, a burger place. This, (laughs) I immediately knew what was going to happen here. Because in the picture... Chef Slawick, very young, you know, has a big old grin on his face. And I thought to myself, oh, they're going to do the thing where he rediscovers his love of cooking by flipping a burger. And uh, they they do build to that. 
Um, it's like a reverse ratatouille. It is a reverse ratatouille. You're exactly right. I I thought about ratatouille while watching the movie. Um, but so dessert is being prepared, and he is making this big grandiose statement. He is, you know, this is the big finale once again, and Margot. Asks, I think she asks Chef Slawick, hey, when are you going to make some real food? <laughs> and he has been, you know, he's he's worn his feelings on his sleeve the whole evening, right? He's argued with other guests about his food. Um, and she, she goes on to call his cooking loveless and talks about how she's still hungry because none of the food that he has offered has been worth eating. And he is fed up. He goes up to Margot. He says, what would you like me to make you then? And she asks for a cheeseburger, and you see this light flicker in his eyes in a, as you said, Adam, reverse ratatouille moment. And he's, like, smiling while making the cheeseburger, and it's so ridiculous. And when she brings, or when, when Chef Slawick brings the burger to Margot, she asks, can I have it to go? And he looks around and takes a big dramatic breath and brings her a little doggy bag, and she is allowed to leave. But then, even though he's had this life-changing moment and he allowed this woman to leave the island, he still kills all these people. Like, <laughs> like whatever trans transformation happened in that moment meant literally nothing. So you, you wonder, okay, well, then why did he let her go then? The, you know, because she allowed him to find that passion for cooking or are we just building inconsistent characters that don't really make sense? I like him letting her go. Because his big kind of conflict throughout the movie is that he's planned this night to the T, is so meticulously laid out this plot. And the fact that Margot is there instead of this other woman has completely derailed what he wanted to do. He, he wanted it to be this one woman. You know, there's all this comeuppance, basically that he's trying to wreak on these people, but he doesn't know her. He doesn't know if she's deserving of being killed like this. So it feels like, okay, well, this is a good way to have her escape and have him return to the plan he had originally. This is how he can still kind of make it work. But then, like, yeah, like you said, he doesn't, I guess, redis he for this one moment exclusively rediscovers the love for cooking and uh, there's like this class commentary that like it, it's more like the ghost of a class commentary it doesn't really exist and he seems to like her and think she's special and, and maybe a little more innocent because she is what he says is like us the shit shovelers so she is not this pretentious elite Yet, throughout the movie, he's still, like, putting her through this torturous night anyway. He doesn't just let her go at the beginning. And Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I don't know what the change of heart exactly was. I do like that he keeps comparing himself to her. Because he's like, we both serve people. You know, like, he finds that. That's, like, their common denominator. Like, we both work with people. We both, like, live to serve, basically. And, um... You know how that how the the psychological effect that has on you, uh, and I bought all that. Like I bought that connection. It's just for me the end. Like, yeah, why do this this big demonstration after you've had a change of heart? An another thing is he sends her to go get the dessert barrel um, as a way for her to prove herself to him as one of the chefs, as being on his side, as he puts it, and she calls in the Coast Guard guy, and it ends up being a, a ploy just to test her loyalty. And this is how he determines she wasn't loyal. She wasn't one of them. She's actually a taker. She's one of the ones who deserves to die. But also, on the other hand, if he didn't know that she was going to be there, then how and why did he have this whole... Coast Guard radio trap set up. You know, this is another inconsistency. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's funny. The more you... <laughs> the more we discuss it, the more I'm starting to realize how many 
weird little things there are in this movie. I know. Not to, you know, I'm sorry to crap all over this movie, but removing that no, half mean, star. <laughs> yeah, honestly, I might it might lose it. It might lose it. Dessert, shall we? Please. This is my please. least favorite part of the movie. Yeah, okay. This, this is my least favorite part of the movie. Okay. He comes out after Anya Taylor-Joy, who is the best character, right? She's gone. So we've lost that. He presents to the guests who still care for whatever reason. My thing is that they're still like listening to him, mouth agape. Like they're all just like listening to all the words he's saying, right? They're, they're listening to him monologue. And it even seems like they've, they're, they've kind of started to enjoy it at the end of the movie. Did you catch that? Like they're all watching him speak. And, you know, Ray Fiennes, he, he speaks so eloquently. Um, but the guests are just watching him, not in horror, but in like, like they're watching a poet recite their work i thought that was weird and i i don't know i didn't hate that per se but this is the part i disliked the the sous chefs or i guess the sous chef and all the cooks they bring out these like intricate scarves made of marshmallows and like these chocolate hats and they start to adorn the guests who are just sitting there and they're taking it and they're putting all these things on them and covering the floor with like marshmallow cream and crushed graham crackers and uh you know it's kind of pretty i guess they're like painting the floor with food chef slawick says that this is a fancier take on s'mores because s'mores are trash and it's like a combination of some of the worst stuff you can get and that's why this is his big finale I guess because the people in this room are the combination of some of the worst people you could find. Um, there is some sort of comment like that at the end of it. I'm sure you remember too. But anyway, the end is that he roasts them all like s'mores, like marshmallows at a campfire. He sets the restaurant on fire and we get this lingering shot of like the flames rising, Chef Slawick in the middle of the room, burning, um, the flames engulfing all the people that are just sitting there taking it, right? Not trying to run out, not trying to break through the windows, just taking it. And uh, Margot, one of the last shots in the movie, or I believe the last shot in the movie, is Margot uh, watching the restaurant explode in the distance. She has made her way onto the Coast Guard boat and is escaping. And she unpacks her little burger and she eats it. And that's the end of the movie. And it's so there's a lot of things i felt it was half-baked i i don't understand why there was no fight to any of those people i don't understand why there was no character development after this big massive gesture of letting margot leave the island uh the night remains the same yeah and i find that to be lame but also just like the choice of having her just watch the fire and eat her burger i i can feel it's trying to say something but I don't know what, and I don't think it's, you know, I, she's horrified. She's been horrified all evening. She is not like these people. So why now is she just like desensitized? You know, I, I don't know. Well, it's, um, they kind of give it like a, there's this sense that like she understands him and respects him now. And that's why maybe she watches back on it, like knowing it's his final gesture. But why? Why is she not like, this man is a psychopath who tried to kill me and successfully killed a bunch of other people? Like, yeah, I don't know. why does she suddenly, oh, well, he's actually a sensitive artist. Like, no, no. Yeah, the ending didn't work for me. <laughs> the ending didn't work for me. It lost me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I gotta say, I still maintain, I think this movie had some moments. I do. I don't think it's all bad, but I do think there are some some ugly parts. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I got to be honest. Right. I like the ending oh, go ahead. Uh, more than really? some other parts of the movie. Yeah, I, th I thought it came well, up a little why. bit. Well, tell me why. I like that they found a way to have Margot escape through reaching Ray Fine's character, Chef Slawick, because it feels like he's um, this disturbed uh, and emotionally ruined individual i guess you know it's like uh it's like <laughs> in in friday the 13th 2 when she pretends to be jason's mom maybe i don't know <laughs> i don't know i i'm I, I like that they found a way to get her out of there 
if that makes sense. And like we've just discussed, there's problems with that. But this movie is flawed from beginning to end. So I will have to accept a certain level of flaw with the ending. No, I, I, you know, that makes sense. I understand that. At the end of the day, I was just happy they got her out of there, too. Um, because her character really is given such a... Uh, just such a... Uh, uh, what, what's the poker? She was given such a poor hand. I don't know why that... <laughs> that was so hard for me to find. She was given such a poor hand just from the beginning of this movie. And as you start to see just how used she is and, and how she really, really isn't one of these people, you do want her to escape. Um, the, the problem with that is that she's the only one that you really feel anything towards. <laughs> and um, yeah, as, as much as I like Anya Taylor-Joy, she, you know, it's not enough. It's not enough for this movie. Right. I think that this movie um, with a few tweaks could actually be quite good. I do. You know, but for all the reasons we've discussed, I think it falls short of being a really, really solid film. Um, it's it's shaky. It's wobbly. Well, I know we've spent so much time kind of dissing this movie, but I do think that this movie is maybe the best example of this kind of movie, of this uh, rich people are crazy. Um, people get trapped in a place and murder ensues. You know, I think this is one of the best examples of that genre. You know, the Hunt movie probably does not even hold a candle to this. However, I think it's just a bad type of movie. The premise is not good <laughs> innately. But I don't know. It, it, I guess you're right, though. It could have could have been more consistent at least yeah no i i agree i think it could have been more consistent i think it could have done you know more original less derivative things <laughs> it, it was funny until you pointed out to me how prevalent this genre is because i guess i'll call it a genre i didn't really really think about it but you're right people crave this sort of commentary i just wish it was better <laughs> yeah yeah, and you know, I was biased against it because I disliked that so this sort of movie. So maybe, you know, take my opinion with a grain of salt. Uh, but when I saw the commercial for it, I was like, oh, another one of those films. I'm not interested. <laughs> well, yeah. And I think where a lot of these movies fall short is that their commentary, it's very... Uh, they cast a really wide net and it just kind of comes off as vague and shallow, right? Whereas a movie like Parasite that is trying to, well, or rather I'd argue, that is successfully um, making really smart social commentary about um, class and, and how people divide themselves. That, that movie is so specific to like South Korean society. And yet from the specific we are able to get a really, really solid and impactful general message. Whereas this movie, it's uh, doing a lot. It's making a lot of, you know, rich people are weird. And yet <laughs> there's not a lot there at the end of the day. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I, I mean, that's, I think that's all I had to say about this movie. Um, yeah. No, I've, I've said what I think. Uh, it is on HBO Max. So if you have HBO Max and you are curious... It's there. Yeah, and um, you know... We... Also... Sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, no. Maybe you were going to say exactly what I was going to say. People seem to really like this movie. That's, yeah, that is what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We talk trash on it, but it's being well-received. And while it is on HBO Max, it did have a theatrical release. It's still in theaters, I believe. And it has made money uh, on the theatrical release alone. Probably more money on HBO as well, so... It's successful and people like it. And and that does mean something, I guess. Maybe yeah, not to me. But... <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you for joining me, Adrian. Thank you. I'm glad we could talk about it, at least. Yeah, I'm very glad we uh, we could at least talk about it, yeah. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Goodbye. <laughs>